Hello everyone! Today we're going to talk about a classic from 1972, produced by Irwin Allen and directed by Ronald Neem, The Poseidon Adventure. An earthquake on New Year's Eve causes a huge tidal wave which forces an ocean liner en route to Athens to tip over, plunging the upper decks underwater. Ten survivors attempt to work their way up to the bottom of the ship, hoping to cut through the hull to the water's surface. The film features the acting talents of Gene Hackman, Ernest Borgnine, Red Buttons, Carol Lindley, Roddy McDowell, Stella Stevens, Shelley Winters, Jack Albertson, Pamela Sue Martin, and Eric Shea, with Arthur O'Connor and Leslie Nielsen as the captain. The Poseidon Adventure was not the first disaster film, not even close. Plain disaster and natural disaster movies go way back. Even ocean liner disaster films had been done before, including several about the Titanic. But it was the first film to tackle a disaster of this magnitude, with this much spectacle and sincerity. And few films that have come after have done that so well. The disaster movie phenomena of the 1970s is primarily associated with one name, big-time film and television producer Irwin Allen. He'd enjoyed a successful run on television in the 60s with The Time Tunnel, Lost in Space, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and Land of the Giants. Then he switched gears and became determined to turn the Poseidon Adventure novel into a movie, in spite of dozens of risks and the possibility that at any moment 20th Century Fox might scrap the entire project. The result of Alan's persistence, to everyone's surprise, was a huge success that, coupled with 1970's Airport, gave birth to a new, very popular genre the star-studded, special effects-driven, catastrophe-focused spectacle. This trend dominated the decade. Alan himself was responsible for the Poseidon Adventure, the Towering Inferno, Flood, Fire, the Swarm, and When Time Ran Out. These earned him the nickname the Master of Disaster. Plus, there were similar films that came out at that time that actually had nothing to do with him, but became associated with him nonetheless. Not all of Alan's productions were winners. In fact, it seemed the more money that went into making them, the less successful they were. The Poseidon Adventure had a budget, a very strict budget, of $5 million and made $93.3 million at the domestic box office. The Towering Inferno, Alan's biggest commercial success, had a $14 million budget and made $116 million at the domestic box office. However, later in the decade, 1978's The Swarm had a budget of $21 million but made only $10 million at the box office, and 1980's When Time Ran Out, a volcano film that you never hear anybody talk about, had a $20 million budget and grossed only $3.8 million. Yikes. <laughs> By the late 70s, the trend had been overcooked, and what had been well-received at the beginning of the decade was now getting a lukewarm response at best and facing a lot of derision. And when Airplane came along in 1980 to lampoon the airport movies, that pretty much put the nail in the coffin. Until the 90s renaissance. The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno stand out as the best of these films, though, and The Poseidon Adventure in particular still reigns supreme in the disaster movie genre. What sets it apart, I think, are the story, the cast of characters, and the visuals. For some time now, I have found survival adventure stories appealing, especially ones that take place at sea. I think my mom deserves a lot of credit for instilling that interest in me. The Poseidon Adventure is one of her favorite movies. She loves it, she can quote it, and so I've been familiar with it since I was a little kid. I've seen it many times, though I think I'd only seen the very beginning once or twice before. The SS Poseidon is making her last voyage, and things aren't going very well. Huge waves are making the passengers seasick, they're having a ballast problem, and the captain is being pressured by the new owner's representative to reach their destination ahead of schedule. But the passengers are blissfully unaware of the tension on the bridge, and that night they ring in the new year in the ballroom with optimism and excitement. That party atmosphere comes to an abrupt halt when alarms start shrieking over Old Lang Syne, and midnight revelry becomes terror and confusion as the ship begins to turn over and objects and bodies go flying. 
From that point on, it becomes a fight for survival. Characters have to convince each other there's a way out of the ballroom. They have to learn to trust each other and to push their own limits. Each move forward presents a new dangerous obstacle and a new problem to be solved. It's one harrowing sequence after another, and not everyone makes it. Sterling Siliphant's screenplay was based on the 1969 novel of the same name, written by Paul Gallico. I've never read the book, but I think it might be interesting to check it out sometime. It sounds like it might go even more in-depth with character study and psychological drama than the film, with its inevitable time constraints, was able to do. The movie does a fine job with the two hours it's given, though, and that's thanks largely to the writing and the acting. It's not just about the characters themselves, but about the way they interact with each other, about their relationships, the friction that arises when strong personalities clash, and the unexpected bonds that form between unlikely companions. Gene Hackman plays the central role of Reverend Scott, a preacher whose unconventional ideas have put him at odds with his church. His God helps those who help themselves philosophy is not one that I personally agree with, but it's a foundational theme of the film. He believes God wants triers and winners, and that people shouldn't waste their time kneeling in prayer when they can be doing something to save themselves. That's a pretty shocking statement coming from a preacher, but thematically it fits as he becomes the de facto leader, encouraging people not just to sit and wait for a rescue that may never reach them, but to take action and get to the one spot where help, if it does ever arrive, is most likely to come from. Scott's motivational tactics can at times be brusque and unrelenting, but he's not an unfeeling man, and I appreciate the poignant exchange when he's leaving the chaplain behind in the ballroom. The chaplain doesn't disagree with Scott's passionate argument about going up to the bottom of the boat, but the chaplain feels it's his duty to stay behind. He can't abandon the injured and the frightened in their hour of need, even if it means staying with them will lead to his own death. Scott is grieved by this, and he sees it as a pointless sacrifice, but he does seem to recognize that the chaplain's reasoning is compassionate and noble in its own right. Ernest Borgnine plays Mike Rogo, a rough New York detective lieutenant who's finally gotten a chance to go on this fancy vacation with his wife Linda, played by Stella Stevens. They're an odd couple. She's a former prostitute with a fiery temper who Rogo kept arresting, and he's a man of authority who doesn't like taking orders from someone who's not officially in charge, so he repeatedly butts heads with Scott, who assumes the role of leader without asking anyone's permission. Both Mr. and Mrs. Rogo are colorful people who yell a lot, often to humorous effect. During one argument, Rogo goes on and on about their very private business at max volume, their often caustic lines provide a lot of the comic relief, and their delivery is always on point, but in spite of their bickering, there is affection and love there. Rogo, in particular, shows an unexpected well of emotion at pivotal moments. Put that down to Borgnine being an incredibly expressive actor who conveys a lot with his face in a single shot. Red Buttons plays James Martin, a lonely haberdasher who's been too occupied with his work to enjoy life and meet someone. At first, he seems like an awkward OCD type with his funny morning speed walk and his baggie full of vitamins at dinner. But there's a moment in the aftermath of the accident where he somberly places his jacket over a dead girl's body, and that gesture tells you pretty much all you need to know about the quality of his character. He's a late bloomer, but he's quietly heroic, stepping up to help survivors and raise the Christmas tree and urge people to join Scott's group. Carol Lindley plays Nani, a singer who's traveling with her brother and their band to a jazz festival, sailing for free in exchange for music. She struggles to accept her brother's death, and without him, she doesn't see much point in going on. Martin spots her in the ballroom and gently convinces her to come with him, promising to look out for her, which he faithfully does. Nani is the most timid character by far. At one point, she has to climb up a ladder that hangs over rising water. As she's holding on, another character plummets to his death, causing Nani to panic. Right away, Martin rushes to her aid. Carol Lindley, I found out, was actually afraid of heights in real life. She wasn't even comfortable on stepladders, and neither am I, so possibly some of her terror in this scene was real. You know, I think of all the personalities here, I relate the most to Nani. 
She doesn't want to leave her loved one behind. She's scared of pretty much everything. She doesn't know how to swim. And she becomes attached to the person who reaches out to her. That would probably be me in this scenario. But I don't think I'd ever find myself in a situation like this because given that I'm very uneasy out on the ocean with no land in sight, and given some of the nightmarish situations that have occurred on cruise ships in the last 10 to 15 years, I would never go on a cruise. Absolutely not. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't mind watching movies where people go on cruises, and sure, there's something romantic about the idea, but you'll never catch me on one. <laughs> not willingly. <laughs> Shelley Winters and Jack Albertson play Belle and Manny Rosen, an older Jewish couple on their way to Israel to meet their two-year-old grandson for the first time. Belle is a sentimental people-watcher with a warm heart who wants to help everyone. Case in point, she feels pity for Martin and takes him under her wing. Winters gained weight for the role, and while she was already a competent swimmer, she underwent a couple months of additional training so she could do that sequence in which her character, a former swimming champion, has to dive underwater. For her performance, Shelley Winters earned an Academy Award nomination. As a couple, they are a major contrast with the Rogos, more traditional and more expressive to each other. Belle has a maternal attitude toward everyone in the group, while her other half, Manny, has his own little arc, coming to realize the true depths of his love for his wife over the course of their journey. Albertson skillfully makes the most of his screen time, conveying a good deal of feeling with minimal dialogue. Pamela Sue Martin and Eric Shea play Susan and Robin Shelby, two kids making the sea voyage alone, expecting to reunite with their parents at the end of it. Susan's got a crush on Reverend Scott, something he can't help noticing, I'm sure, given the way she watches him. It's evident and perfectly understandable from their first scene together that Robin drives Susan crazy, but she learns that she has to look out for him, and that she'd rather be with him than without. Robin at first is a very annoying kid. He'd be at least 50% more likable if he started using his indoor voice, but his character turns out to be indispensable. He spent so much time talking to the crew and exploring the ship that he knows more about it than anyone else. Over and over again, his head full of knowledge saves them. I also give him credit for how much he grows up. At one point, he says something to Mrs. Rosen, realizing afterward how insulting it might have sounded. So at the first opportunity, he apologizes. There are adults who aren't capable of that kind of decency. English director Ronald Neem would seem an odd pick for this movie, as he was associated more with dramas than actioners, but he turned out to be instrumental in helping distinguish the Poseidon adventure as a character-driven film. Emphasizing the human element added relatability, gravity, and emotion. And at the end of the day, those things matter more than all the special effects that money can buy. Ultimately, this is a story about individuals working together as a team, about the strong helping the weak to find their inner strength, and about powerful acts of sacrifice. Every character has something to contribute, even if that contribution is emotional support or motivation. Scott not only takes charge, but encourages people when they feel like they can't do the next thing that's required of them. He depends on Rogo's brute strength, Martin's practical thinking, and injured waiter Acres' familiarity with the staff area of the ship. It's Acres' position, marooned by the linen closet, that gives Martin the idea of going up, and Robin knows about the thickness of the hull, information that gives everyone hope that what they're trying to accomplish is actually possible. Manny encourages Belle to keep going, even when she doesn't think she can manage it, and Belle comes to Scott's and everyone's rescue with her swimming skills, Linda snaps Rogo out of it whenever he's being difficult and hindering their progress, Susan goes after Scott when he's taking too long to return, finding him in a rare moment of discouragement and helping him figure out a way around an obstacle, and Nani and Martin depend on each other. She needs him to get her through physically, but he also becomes her emotional support. And he needs her just as much, I think, as a reason to keep pressing on despite setbacks. By the way, you know who I consider the most unlikable character? The Purser, a pompous man who earlier in the evening was bragging that he was the most important man on the ship, more important even than the captain. He adamantly refuses to go with Scott, instead putting his trust in the watertight compartments. 
Ha! If I've learned anything from all the Titanic movies I've seen, it's not to have blind faith in those darn watertight compartments. Titanic comes to mind a lot when I'm watching The Poseidon Adventure because there are some similarities. There's a tug of war between speed and safety. The initial tragedy is caused by unexpected destructive contact with a natural element, an iceberg and a tidal wave, and specifically in reference to the 1997 James Cameron film, the scene here where the boat turns over and everyone's sliding into walls and clinging to tables that are bolted to the floor reminds me of the climactic sequence from Titanic, which is the best scene in the movie in my opinion, where the ship is sinking and the stern rises out of the water, the steep angle sending people flying and bouncing off railings and propellers. The pivotal tidal wave sequence in The Poseidon Adventure is undeniably a highlight of the film. There are some painful looking crashes and fatalities, and it crescendos with the famous shot of a character losing his grip on a table and plummeting to his death in the huge ceiling light. That was no stuntman, by the way. That was the actor himself, against his better judgment, doing the fall. A set was built in such a way that it could be tilted. When they started rolling, a forklift would slowly lift one end of the set so everything and every one would slide naturally. The effect is movie magic. And what do you know, the scene in Titanic was also made using a huge tilting set. It was Erwin Allen who supervised a lot of the action scenes, though Ronald Neem was not himself entirely a stranger in that field, having been the cinematographer on the 1943 British war drama One of Our Aircraft is Missing, which won an Academy Award for its special effects. Neem would later direct another disaster film, 1979's Meteor. In the Poseidon Adventure, the retired British ocean liner the Queen Mary was used for exterior shots of the ship and provided inspiration for some interior design, while models were used for the underwater shots, since they definitely weren't going to capsize the Queen Mary. But the other explosions and the fire and the water were all the real thing to the physical discomfort of the cast. Many cast members were eager to do as many of their own stunts as possible, and I for one am always impressed to see it's the actors themselves swimming in the underwater sequence and not body doubles. By the way, because this event occurs in the middle of a party, everyone's stuck wearing their best clothes. Tuxes, evening gowns, heels. These are the worst possible outfits to be wearing in the event of an emergency. Especially an emergency where you're going to have to climb ladders and clamber all over stuff. I love that the movie gives a nod to the reality of impractical shoes, flimsy materials, and excessive skin exposure. Some people fare better than others, of course. Susan's alright. She happened to wear a detachable skirt with matching hot pants underneath. But Linda, <laughs> well, she has to go climbing all over the bowels of the ship in strappy heels and her husband's dress shirt. The sets that the characters have to navigate are amazing, with the creative and almost surreal imagery of everything turned upside down. The kitchen, the barber shop, the restroom, the jungle gym of an inverted engine room. Every space, modeled after carefully drawn storyboards, shows great attention to detail. And then there's the music. John Williams wrote this score, and as much as I don't want to be that person, I've got to say, I like his main theme from The Poseidon Adventure better than some of his much more popular and famous works. I think I've referred to this music in a couple past videos, and Whenever I did, I wondered if anyone even had a clue what I was talking about. This soundtrack typically doesn't come up when people are discussing John Williams' music. Neither does the score for the 1979 Dracula, though, and that's my favorite, I think, of all his compositions. I'd never listened to the entire soundtrack from The Poseidon Adventure before, but someone uploaded it on YouTube, so I gave it a listen, and while I was preparing to make this video, I listened to it, um eight or nine times in the background. There's a dark undercurrent to the score, no pun intended. <laughs> it's got some eerie moments, and at times the music reflects the groaning and buzzing sounds of the ship itself, and there's a rolling rhythmic element to it that has a connotation of constant movement, while the main theme, which reappears at key points in the film, is somehow both foreboding and heroic.
In addition to the score, there's the song from the Poseidon Adventure, music and lyrics by Al Kasha and Joel Hirshhorn. It's also known as The Morning After, and while the more famous version is the hit single recorded by Maureen McGovern in 1973, it appeared here first, its lyrics purposely written to reflect the plot and spirit of the film. Nani sings it twice, once in rehearsal and once in performance, Carolyn Lee dubbed by Renee Armand, and there are three other occasions I noticed where Williams incorporates traces of the melody into the score as the character's motif, but it's subtle enough that I went years without picking up on it. At the Academy Awards, The Poseidon Adventure received eight nominations, third most after The Godfather and Cabaret. It was up for score, cinematography, editing, art direction, costume design, and sound, and won for best original song and special achievement in visual effects. It did get a sequel in 1979, titled Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, which I haven't seen. I've heard it's more of a fortune-hunting adventure film, and it's not held in high regard. There was also a television miniseries produced in 2005, and a theatrically released film, simply titled Poseidon, in 2006, which I've only seen a few minutes of. Both remakes boast impressive cast lists and updated special effects, but from what I've heard, Neither one holds a candle to the first film. I would love to hear what you think of The Poseidon Adventure if you've seen it, and if you haven't, I encourage you to check it out because it's a great film. A thrilling story with an exceptional cast, with characters who sometimes make you laugh, who you pull for and grieve with, who you want to succeed on this epic and memorable journey through an upside-down ship. I hope you enjoyed this review, share what you think in the comments below, and stay tuned for another video next week. Thanks for watching!